Good morning. It is Wednesday morning. It is time for Bible study, and I could not be more excited. Uh, we are starting today this uh, look into God's Word at the topic of promises, promises that are given to us in the Bible through God's Word, promises that God Himself has given us. So I want to start out by looking at what is a promise. And if you look in the dictionary, it says a promise. If it's a noun, it says a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen. A declaration or an assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen. The quality of potential excellence. An indication that something specified is expected or likely to occur. If you use it as a verb, it says to assure someone that one will definitely do, give, or arrange something, undertake, or declare that something will happen. It is a pledge, especially to a woman, to marry someone else or to betroth of a person, publication, institution, to announce something as being expected to happen. And then if you promise yourself, contemplate the pleasant expectation of. So what is a promise? A promise, if it comes from God, is a promise that we can expect something to happen that we can expect something to come forth, that we can expect something to be just exactly like God says it will be. Did he promise that? Then it will be exactly like he said it would be. There are times when I promise somebody that I'll do something and then something might happen or maybe things turn around and I can't do it. I have to break my promise. I promised Steve 50 years ago I would marry him and stay with him. And I was just thinking this morning that when we make those vows, I was 18 years old, when we make those vows, I wonder if we really, truly know how serious that is through sickness and in health. Well, when you're 18 and 21 years old, you're thinking, what could we go through? We're both young. We're strong. Our parents are young. Our parents are strong. What will we go through? Then, maybe very quickly for some, you realize there are things in our lives that we just don't have control of. There are things in our lives that we might have to struggle with. There are things in our lives we might have to go through. Um... There are things in our life that God says, I, I've promised you this, but I've also told you that if you go the other way with that, there will be consequences. Our decisions do not change God's mind. They don't, not at all. God has a purpose and he has a plan for us, and it's for us to be to do well, to be healthy, to be strong, to be successful. He has a plan for us, and it includes a future. I heard just a few minutes ago on the radio that not many people have been talking about the future because for a year, over a year now, we've been saying, what will the future hold? What will this nation look like in another year? What's going to happen to all of us? I, I'm just amazed at how many people have just decided it's over. You know, we'll never, we'll never be the same. Things will never be the same. I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna recover from this. And, and honestly, we need to look to God's word because three thousand. Let me get this right. Five hundred and seventy-three times. 
it is mentioned in God's word that he is going to do something for us. Or he has something for us. Or he wants this in our lives. 3,573 times. 50 times the word promise in the English translation, 50 times the word promise is mentioned in the Bible. 50 times. Now, we're going to look at all 50 of those. Of course, you know we are. It won't take us 50 days to do that. But when we look at God's word and he promises us something, we can count on it. If Steve says to me, uh, I'm going to be home from work today at 5 o'clock. And 5 o'clock comes. And sometimes 6 o'clock comes, especially before cell phones. And he might be saying, I had somebody come in. I need to talk to him. I was sitting on 210. I was, you know, caught up in a conversation with a couple of the staff members. He can promise me, but there's a chance he won't be able to keep that promise. When God promises us something, take it to the bank. Take it to the bank. I had a, a woman tell me one time that she was uh, sitting in a service with my father-in-law, and the woman next to her said, if right now God said to me, if you go up there and let Pastor Larry pray for you, you're going to lose 50 pounds instantly. She said, what would you do? And the woman who is a good friend of ours, she said, well, I would get up there and I would hold on to my pants, honey. Because if God tells us something and he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Sometimes it's not in our comfort zone with the time. Sometimes we have to wait days, months, years. But if God tells us something, it will happen. The first promise mentioned in the Bible, the very first time God says, this is what's going to happen, is in Genesis 3 and 14. So look in your Bible at Genesis 3 and 14. So this is the now infamous story of where God has told Adam and Eve, you have full reign of this garden, except I do not want you to eat from that tree. I do not. Don't do it. And maybe they were like, well, okay. You know, we've got, look at all the other trees we've got to eat from in the garden. Listen, you think about Whole Foods, and this, this was incredible. The Garden of Eden. You could go in, you could eat anything, and it would be satisfying uh, better than Chick-fil-A service. I mean, just the best. So he's already warned him, and Eve knows about it. And she and she and Adam are standing in the garden. She and Adam are standing in the garden, and the serpent says to her, Did God really say that? No. Oh no, God. Did God really say that? That's what Satan says to us when we are getting ready to break one of God's rules in our life. God doesn't care if you do that. That's not really adultery. That's not really fornication. That, that's Old Testament teaching. I don't, I wouldn't, would you consider that to be lying? I wouldn't consider that to be lying. Would you call that being disrespectful to your mother and your father? That's not what that really means. That's not what that really means. Is there really a hell? Would God do that? This merciful, loving God that you have, would he really allow someone to go to hell? That's how the serpent, serpent speaks to us now. And we buy it. We eat the apple. We just munch right into it. We share it. We share it with our, our family. We turn around to our family who are standing right there. Adam, the head of the house, 
So all of these men, all of you men who want to say head of the house, head of the house, head of the house, be the head of the house. Be the head of the house. Why didn't Adam look, he looked over and he saw that she had picked up, picked up that beautiful shiny apple and, and she's holding it out. She took a bite. Well, just before she gets ready to take a bite, why didn't Adam go, get out of there. What are you doing? No, no, no. My dogs think I'm talking to them. Good news. No. Why didn't he do that? Then when she turned to offer him the apple, why didn't he say, no, no, put an end to this. I'm the head of you, and, and I'm over you, and you're taken from my rib, you're flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. No, we're not going to eat this, and, and now I'm going to pray over you so that that apple that's in you will just regurgitate. Why didn't he? But he didn't. They bought into it. They bought into it. And because they bought into it, because they disobeyed, because they chose to do what they wanted to do rather than what God had been telling them to do, he, he turns, the Lord turns to the snake and he says, all right, cursed are you above all livestock. So if you think pigs are filthy and roaches are filthy, this is saying to the snake, you are cursed above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. That's a curse. That's a curse. And because you have done this to these children that I put here in this garden because you have tempted them, because you have gone against what I'm asking them to do, because you have come in between them and me and my promises and my goals and my futures, then you're cursed. Get down. You can no longer walk upright. We don't know what he looked like. Maybe the little uh, Geico gecko. Maybe he looked kind of like that. But he says, no, 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 no. You can just crawl on your belly and eat just the rest of your life. And then he says, and I'm going to tell you furthermore, I will put enmity or I will put hate. I will put, um, um, I will put, uh, uh, I will put <laughs> between you and the woman, you and the man, I will put this disconnect I will put this curse between the two of you that all the days of your life, it's going to be coming against you. And then it says, and between your offspring and hers, between your offspring and hers, your offspring, Satan, you are cursed. Your demons, cursed. Those people, those evil people, that you manage to persuade to follow you. We say, I am a child of God. Others say, I am a child of Satan. Satan is my father. That's when, when Jesus says, when you're lying, then, the father, uh, then Satan is your father, and he is the father of lies, and that is his native lung, language. So he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and and the woman, not you and Adam, you and the woman. Why? Why between you and the woman? Because <clears throat> the woman's offspring, the old woman's offspring, they're going to come. And they're going to come against you so hard, so strong, that they will crush your head. He, specifically here, he. He will crush your head. Now, I've told you this story before. I won't go into it again, but when we lived in Upper Marlboro, my daughters, they crushed the head of the enemy. They got a machete and crushed and killed a snake. They ran over it 50-something times with their automobile. Then they took the machete and chopped it up some more. They crushed the head of their enemy. They crushed it. This word is a promise.
that one day the, the son, the offspring of Mary, will come and he will crush your head, Satan. Serpent, you don't have a chance. He is going to crush your head. He's going to use a machete. He's going to run over you a thousand times with his car. You will be put in chains. You will be put in bondage. You will not be free anymore to roam the earth. This is my promise to you, Satan. You will be crushed by the offspring that will come from this woman. Isn't that a wonderful promise for us? Isn't that a great promise for us? All right. So now look over, uh, because we have proved that that really happened. Look at Luke 2 and 7. Look at 2 and 7. Luke 2 and 7. Look at 6. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She gave birth. She, Mary, the offspring of Eve, she gave birth to her firstborn son. This is the way that promise is fulfilled. He could have sent a legion of angels to fulfill this. But instead, he sent his only begotten son. He sent Jesus Christ. He wrapped him in flesh. And he sent him to earth to crush Satan's offspring. To come against him, to crush him. Did he say he would? Yes. Did it happen? Yes. Now look at um, Galatians 4, 4. Look at Galatians 4 and 4. Galatians 4 and 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, but under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. I want to go ahead because I love this. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but ch God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Because you are also his son. God has made you his heir. He said, here's how I'm going to do it, Satan. I'm going to use Mary, uh, Eve's offspring to crush your head. I promise you that. You see, when we get a promise, we want to think of it as something that's going to be wonderful. But for Satan, this was a really bad news promise. This was like maybe your mother said, my mom didn't do this, but I know a lot of moms said, when your dad gets home, you're going to get a whipping. When your dad gets home, you're going to get a whipping. Here's the, here's the difference. My mother was like, get in this house because I'm going to spank you. Mother did not wait on dad. She did not take the chance that maybe dad would be like more understanding because mom was a firsthand eyewitness and she took care of stuff right then. But this is... God saying to Satan, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to send my son. And he is going to massacre you. He's going to crush you. You're going to try to really come back and come back and come back. But it's not going to work for you. Because when the time is right, when the time is right, I'm going to send my son, and he's going to crush you. I wonder at some point if the snake that my girls killed, if its mother ever said, I got a bad feeling about you going up in the Lowry's yard. 
Don't do it. I wouldn't do that if I were you. And maybe that snake said, it was a big snake, so it wasn't a little baby. Maybe that snake said, I just don't believe that stuff. I just don't believe that I could ever be killed by two little old girls. I don't. Maybe that serpent said, Eve was so easy to deceive. It was such an easy thing. I mentioned it. She ate it. Then she turned around and shared it with her husband. I wonder, I wonder if Satan thought at that point, there's not going to be any struggle here. These people are easy to fool. They're, they don't even know they're standing there naked. I'm going to put so much shame. I'm going to put so much sorrow. I'm going to put so many things in their lives that they will beg me to be their God. But the next promise that we're going to study is that God is always there to help us. Always there. He's always there to help us. So, yeah, we're still being tempted. We're still being tempted all the time. But God can turn temptation into a, I don't want any part of that. God can take temptation and move it out of our way and out of our life and out of our purview in such a way that we aren't worrying about that anymore. We're not even tempted by that anymore. Last night, we had spaghetti for dinner. I bet you thought we had chicken pot pie and soup. We did not. We had spaghetti for dinner. All of that chicken pot pie and all that soup is in there and kids took it for lunch today. Uh, right now, Amy and Steve are staying with us and so... Uh, and I'm going to take some over to the church. So, uh, for dessert, I put two cans of cherry pie filling in the bottom of a pan, and then I made a cake mix. My mother must be like, oh, Janice, oh, Janice, honey, why? Why would you do that? So, anyway, I made a cake mix and dumped that on top of that cherry pie filling, and let it bake up, and it was delicious. We ate it hot. So all this morning while I was getting ready, the whole time I was doing my hair, I was thinking I'm going to have a cup of coffee. I'm going to have some of that cherry, whatever that is, cherry dump cake. I don't, I don't even know what it is. And I kept thinking, you know, I had some last night. I really should not eat cake for breakfast this morning. So, I went downstairs this morning to eat that cherry cake, and it was covered with ants. I don't even know how they got into that cake, because nowhere else in my kitchen could I find a single ant. But on the island of my kitchen were ants. Now, I'm going to tell you, I was not tempted. Not one minute. I didn't think maybe I could scrape some of those off. No. I completely put it under the sink and just let that water run and wash it away. I'm going to tell you, I truly do believe that God takes care of the temptations if we rely on him, if we depend on him, if we look at things in our life. Now, I'm not talking about cake right now, but if we <laughs> protein, <laughs> not protein, Kelly. I should have thought about that. If we rely on him, if we fully trust him, if we truly depend on him, if we truly believe his word, then these promises are here for us. For us. For us. If I'm following his word, if I'm following his commands, if I'm following the things that he is leading me into, then I can also say, I fully trust he's going to do it. I had the most awesome daddy. The most awesome daddy. And if he said to us, Saturday, we're going to go out to, um, out to, I don't know, I'm going to say driving range. I don't know if I ever even did that with Dad, but I'm just going to say that. 
If he said on Saturday, we're going to go to the driving range. If he fell that morning and broke his arm, then as he's leaving the emergency room to get his arm set, we would go to the driving range. Oh, we would. But even my daddy could not promise me that I would have peace in my life. My husband cannot promise me that I can find joy in my life. He cannot. He can promise me that he'll pray for me. And he does pray for me. But only Jesus Christ can bring peace. Only Jesus Christ can be joy, bring joy. So for the rest of this week and probably next week and maybe above and beyond to infinity and beyond, then we're going to be looking at some promises that God has given us in his word. And we're going to start by looking at the 50 times the word promise is mentioned in God's word. I promise you that. I cannot promise you that we will have Bible study tomorrow. I can tell you that it is my desire. It's my plan. I don't know of any other reason why we wouldn't have Bible study tomorrow morning. But tomorrow morning, if I get up and I can't get the Wi-Fi in my house to work and I can't get my phone to turn on, and, and there have been days where that just such a crazy thing happened, well, I can promise you I will not have class. We've had class in my backyard, in the car, at the church, in Cleveland, sitting out in the back of a funeral home. We've had class in every which way kind of situation. I've had class while I had workers tearing my house apart. I've had class while the trash man was making my dog go crazy. I've had class while my neighbor was out here cutting the grass. So I can promise you it is my intention that we will continue having class. And listen, in case you have not heard, Steve and I did announce on Sunday that we are starting the process of retiring from National Church of God. I'm not going to say any more about that because I cannot cry anymore today. It's a good thing. We are retiring in health, in good health. And we're still around. Bible study can go on and on and on because I can do Bible study if I'm laying on the beach in Hawaii and Jesus help me, I hope I get to do that. God's word is eternal. There are no circumstances that can come between us and the promises of God. If God said, I'm going to keep your children, I'm going to watch over you, if he has promised you that, well, Come hell or high water, and hell and high water will try to separate you from that truth, but that is the truth. If God promises you, I'm going to protect your child, I'm going to watch over you. When we came up here 40 years ago, and God promised me, if you will do my will, I will keep you and your children, and you will be safe. If you stay in my will. Have we been through some stuff? Oh, brother. Have we been through some stuff? Are we still here? Yeah, we are. Did he keep his promise? He has. He has. And I expect him to keep it until we are dancing around the throne of glory. When we come into the presence of Jesus Christ... And we learn what it means to truly, truly, truly trust him and believe in him. That his promises are yes. Yes, I promise you that. Yes, I promise you that. I promise you. Maybe you're genetically inclined to have something. But if God has said to you, either through his word or through his voice or through one of his servants, that's not going to happen to you. Don't worry about that anymore. That's not going to happen to you. Well, then I'm not going to worry about that anymore. I'm not. God's promises are in his word. Now, 
if somebody says to you, God told me to tell you that he's going to do such and such, but it's not in alignment with God's word, that's not a promise. It's somebody who is a false prophet. If somebody comes up to you and says, God told me that he's going to give you so-and-so's husband in the next 30 days, you walk away from that. You call it what it is. That's a lie. That's a lie. I don't know where I got so bold, but at some point I became bold enough to be able to say to people, that's a lie. God didn't say that because that doesn't line up with God's word. God's promises. That's what I want to study. That's what I want to be full of. That's what I want to be thinking about. That's what I want to sing about. That's what I want to shout about. That's what I want to talk about. God's promises. And that's what we're going to do for the next, I don't know. I'm not going to set a date because who knows? Who knows what God has in store for us? For those who believe and trust in his name, he has great plans in store. That's a promise. That's a promise. Father, I thank you for your promises. I thank you for your joy. I thank you for your peace. I thank you for the wisdom that we can gain by just opening your word and sharing with one another. God, I thank you for this Bible study that you've allowed me to be a part of it. That you've allowed all of us to come together and to know you in your fullness and the fullness of your promises. We bless your name today. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. 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 I wonder how many of you made chicken pot pie yesterday. I wonder how many of you would like to have some chicken pot pie. I sure would like to share all this chicken pot pie and all of this soup. All right. God bless you. I love you much. I will see you very, very soon. I promise. Tomorrow morning. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>